Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Welcome to Trinity, this service from Trinity United Methodist Church in Little Rock. I'm Roy Smith, the pastor here at Trinity, and it's a joy to welcome you into this time together uh, of worship. I want to call your attention to a couple of announcements. One is, you're watching uh, with a, on the live stream, but some people don't have access to that, and we've begun a new opportunity where people can call in and receive the service, and I got some wonderful feedback from some people that used this last week. So one of the things we're looking for is for you to help identify if there are others who might like to use this way of getting the service. If so, please give us a call uh, in the church office. The upper room for July, is, of course July, July and August, are available at the office, and there's also a way to link to that off of our website during this time of the pandemic. Hope you'll be, feel free to share prayer requests with us at prayer at tumclr.org. That's at, uh, our email address at the website. We send a couple of different things. On Tuesday, our e-blast is about prayer. We send prayer concerns and a prayer that you might use for the week. Then on Friday is really our weekly news e-blast. And of course, we have our, our newsletter. And if you're not receiving all of those, please give us a call and let us get you in, involved in that. Several of you have, have enjoyed coming and spending some time alone in silence here in the sanctuary. We're opening the sanctuary every Tuesday morning from 9 in the morning till noon. The sanctuary door on the north side, the evergreen side, is unlocked. We have lots of macaroni and cheese, but we have lots of hungry folks in Little Rock, so thank you for matching that need the way you've continued to do throughout this time. You know, one of the ways you can share this service is to press share if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, and others that know you will see that you're watching and may come and join us here. Many of you have used our, uh, sometimes some for the first time, our ability to give online at Tithe Online at F-U-M-C, uh, tumclr.org. <laughs> Anyway, too many words for me. Anyway, it's a joy this morning to have our handbell and ensemble playing uh, the prelude for us. We're delighted that Adam Lewis, our director, who had been ill and in the hospital is doing much better, but I pray you'll continue as he continues to gain strength. Adam, we're delighted you're here. We're delighted you're here. And now let's listen as we're called to worship together.
The psalmist cries out, my, as the deer longs for the flowing water, so my soul longs after God. We come in worship to, to meet and to worship God together. So let us uh, sing together our opening hymn this morning, Let All Things Now Living. Let's sing together. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Glad to be here with you. Thank you for that lovely music. Some really pretty songs. Well, I'm gonna tell you a story this morning. It's not exactly the same story that Pastor Roy is going to read um, in the scripture, but I'm hoping that you'll understand it. Maybe a little bit better than um, what Pastor Roy will read. And then at the end, we'll talk about what we're supposed to get out of this, okay? All right, so there's this um, young fellow. His name is Jacob, and he goes shopping one day, and he went to a toy store. Well, in that store, he saw the most wonderful toy, a perfect toy, and it was up on the shelf, and he could see it, and he really wanted that toy. And so he talked to the, um, the store owner about that perfect toy, and Jacob realized he couldn't afford to buy that toy. So he said to the store owner, what if I worked for you doing odd jobs around the store until I had enough saved to buy that perfect toy? Well, the store um, owner thought that would be a great idea. So Jacob worked really hard every day and he worked and he worked and he did odd jobs and he swept and he took out the garbage and he dusted and after lots of days, 
he went to the store owner and he said, I think I have enough money now to buy that perfect toy. Well, the store owner was so pleased and he said, that's great, I'll wrap it up for you. So the store owner got the perfect toy down from the shelf and he wrapped it all up and he put a bow on it and he gave it to Jacob. And Jacob was so excited. He ran out and he ran home. And as he was going home, he saw his friends and he said, come celebrate with me. I have the perfect toy. And so he gets home and his parents are so excited. He's worked so hard and his friends are there and they throw him a party. Mom makes something really wonderful to eat and dad entertains all of his friends. So they partied and they had a wonderful time. And the next morning, Jacob opened up that perfect toy <gasps> to find it wasn't the perfect toy at all. He'd been fooled. So he ran back to the store and he said to the store owner, why did you deceive me? I worked for you really hard and for a really long time. The store owner said, well, that toy wasn't perfect. And it had been on the shelf for a really long time. And I needed to sell it before I could sell the perfect toy. Oh, Jacob was so upset but he still really wanted that perfect toy. And so he said, what if I work for you some more and earn the money to buy that perfect toy? So the owner said, you work really hard. I do have a lot of jobs for you. Yes, you can work for that perfect toy. So eventually everything worked out and Jacob got to have that perfect toy. And it was wonderful to have that perfect toy. There are some things that were a little bit hard at different times with that perfect toy, but he loved that perfect toy. And it meant so much to him because he had worked so hard for it. So now as you hear Pastor Roy's story, it won't be the same, but maybe you can hear different things that are similar. But the thing that I want you to know is that God has a special plan. And even when somebody else messes things up a little bit, or if we have to work really hard to get what God has for us in that special, perfect gift. God always wins. God always gets his way and his plans always come to be. So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the plans you have for us. Thank you for never giving up. Thank you for the stories of people just like us that struggle with their wants and your plan and your timing. Lord, help us to learn from them. Help us to learn from them. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So as we come to God in prayer this morning, I hope that you'll note uh, in our bulletin that we share uh, online with you, we've listed prayer concerns there. And if you have others, I hope you will continue to share them as you have prayer at tumclr.org. And let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray.
Oh God, we give you thanks uh, for this time to gather uh, in worship together, uh, gathering separately but together, united in one heart we are. We come with uh, songs and words uh, and lives that seek to praise you and glorify you in all that we do. We come, O oh Lord, uh, knowing that you are that God that never, that never quits and never lets go, but journeys with us through it all. And we recognize, O oh God, this morning as we come before you that there are times in our lives when we fall short of what you have called and created us to be. We take this moment in prayer and worship to say that we are hardly sorry for our misdoings. And we seek your forgiving love that gives us new beginning and can transform and put us on the path to forgiven lives and reconciliation. Oh Lord, we recognize in our own lives uh, that often there are moments and times that don't work out like we thought they would. And in the midst of our disappointment and often our heartache, our senses of betrayal or loss, it is easy for us to feel alone or to feel overwhelmed. Remind us, O oh God, draw near to us and fill us with your grace that reminds us that you are with us always. And Lord, we give you thanks for the church, the body of Christ, because so often part of how you send your grace in visible ways to us in your love is in the lives of others. For those times that you have sent our brothers and sisters to us as part of that strength and grace, we give you thanks. For times, oh Lord, when you called us to go forth as your as your instruments of grace, we pray that we can have eyes that will see more clearly, ears that can hear and all the noise around us that cries for help, and always a heart that can respond in grace, in grace and love, to be your hands and your feet, literally the body of Christ in this world. And so, Lord, we are grateful for this time together and as part of this time of prayer, we, we take that privilege that you give to us and lift to you the names of those, not only on our listed prayer, but also those in our hearts. O oh, Lord, receive our prayers, hear our prayers. For we offer all of them to you in the name and the spirit of Jesus, who is our teacher and Lord and has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Three, two, one. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine.
fun. Appreciate Will Porter joining the college and his dad who was on the right. I don't know that his name got in the bulletin and uh, thanks to all of them for that great tune. Thanks a bunch. Well, we're continuing to, uh, as we have been throughout the summer, we're looking at stories of our spiritual ancestors of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and then of course now Jacob and Esau and their families. Um, I think we learn a tremendous amount uh, in, these, in these stories, even though they are are ancient, they are so profoundly uh, contemporary uh, in what happens that I think we learn lessons of what it means uh, to love, serve, and follow uh, God. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that as we look at your word that um, you would allow us to hear your word in fresh ways through your spirit, the Holy Spirit whom Jesus promised to send and who comes to us as our teacher. May we be listening today and hear your word. Amen. Jacob, who is the grandson of the patriarch, the one that started all this relationship with God, Abraham. And you remember God came to Abraham and said, I'm gonna make you a great nation, give to you a land, and through you the nations of the world are gonna be blessed and come to know who I am. And so we see the story unfold through uh, Abraham and Sarah's son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebecca. And then they have twin boys. Esau, born first, a kind of manly man, and then Jacob, who liked to spend time with his tents. Clearly, uh, Jacob, uh, the the, the favorite of his mom, and Esau, the favorite of his father. There's no problems at all when you have favorites among your children, right? Yeah, there is just a little bit. So anyway, so Jacob arrives in the world. He's been kind of a wheeler dealer and a trickster his whole life. In fact, at his birth, apparently, he's sort of holding on to his brother's heel as he comes into the world, sort of seeking to get a little extra free ride from the very beginning. And do you remember one day he, he, he outsmarts his dim-witted brother Esau, and for the birthright, that is the one that Esau, being the eldest of the two, would get, it would be a, at the inheritance at the death of their father, a, a double share of everything. And for a, po- a bowl of sort of red lentils, which are good, but not good enough to trade your birthright for, but they were to Esau in that moment as he despised his birthright. Then you remember in this elaborate sort of con scheme, Jacob ends up cheating Esau out of the blessing by dressing up in in furry garments and kind of making his voice a little deeper and and swindles the blessing of of Isaac at his deathbed out of him. And that's when you remember that he he has to flee. Because his brother said, if I get my hands on him, I'm going to kill him. And his mother said, you got to go. you got to go. you got to go far away. Go, go to my brother Laban in Haran. And so Jacob, who has everything, really has nothing. And he takes a few possessions and his camel and starts the journey. It was 500 miles. I mean, it was a huge journey. And so he, he journeys and journeys and journeys. And he finally arrives there in Haran where his uncle Laban lives, his mother's own brother. Well, there was this, there was this uh, spring there, and uh, several flocks would, would water from, uh, their, uh, several shepherds and groups would water from this same one. And there was, in fact, this rock that was a large rock that covered the mouth of it to protect it. And so several of the shepherds from each, each of the different flocks would get together, and they would lift it and set it to the side so that the sheep could drink from this. Well, another group of sheep were coming up being led by a shepherd and the shepherd happened to be a woman who was lovely and beautiful and Jacob was smitten I mean he was smitten he was in love right there and so in a fit of sort of Old Testament macho I guess I don't know what it was he goes over and lifts this stone up all by himself 
And then he meets this stranger and discovers that her name is Rachel. And she invites him to come and stay with their family. And, and uh, there he goes and meets her sister Leah and their father, Laban. Uncle Laban. He finally meets Uncle Laban and they're sort of, I don't know what the right word is, they're sort of game dance begins. So when Laban heard that his sister uh, Jacob was there, he ran to meet him and embraced and kissed him and brought him to his house. And Jacob told Laban all, all of what had happened and about these things. And he said, surely you're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he stayed there for a month. And then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what would your wages be? If you stay here and help me with all these flocks, what do I need to pay you? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely. That's a weird little word. Sometimes she's translated as weak-eyed, sometimes lovely-eyed. But Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Do you get the point? So Rachel was graceful and beautiful. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I'll serve you seven years to marry your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I should give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. So stay with me and serve. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but just a few days because of the love that Jacob had for Rachel. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. And in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her in, to Jacob, and he then later went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. And when morning came, Jacob realized it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you've done to me? Did I not serve you these seven years for Rachel? Why have you deceived me? And Laban said, Oh, this is not done in our country, to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the work of this one, and we will give you another, the other in return for seven more years of serving. So Jacob did so and completed his, the week of the marriage ceremony. And then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife, and her maid Bilhah as Rachel's maid. And Jacob went in to Rachel and loved her more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. And this is the word of God for us. Thanks be to God. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, apparently the, the wedding would have been a big one because Laban was quite a wealthy guy. And so it was a feast that would have ended all feast. It would have been an incredible feast. The wine would have flowed. They would have had uh, uh, wonderful wheat cakes and ash cakes and honey cakes. They would have killed the fatted calf. They would have roasted some goats. And while the men were having this great party, the women would be in preparing the tent for the bride and the groom. They would, they would, they would line it with carpet and, 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 and pillows. They would have cedar boughs and this, uh, this plant called hyssop. It's sort of a minty, lovely smell. Uh, they would have flowers hanging all around and on the spread around would be capers and figs and mandrakes because that apparently they thought would increase your fruitfulness in having children. And then once everything was prepared, at night, the procession would, would, would go and make its way to the bridal tent. The groom was waiting inside, and the bride in her lovely dress and veil, riding on a, on a white donkey, would go, and there they would spend their wedding night together. So everything went as it was supposed to, except at the end of the night and in the morning at first light, Jacob realizes it's not Rachel that's been there with him. It's Leah. He has been, well, the old switcheroo, which he's not, uh, well, he's done a little of that himself, hasn't he? So I guess he got a dose of his own medicine. Wheeling and dealing, I guess, kind of runs in their family. Jacob knows that he's been had. He knows that Uncle Laban has got him. And so he 
says to him, because he loves Rachel so much, that he will serve seven more years in order to have the opportunity to marry Rachel. And so he does. And Jacob's life with his two wives, Leah and Rachel, goes on. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and, and there's a, some degree of um, confusion or difficulty at times having the two of them as his wife. But he never lets anyone not know that Rachel is the favorite. Well, I have to admit, I have never had an experience quite as um, dramatic as that one. Um, but yet, I think we have had experiences, I know I have, in, in which things do not work out the way we thought they would. And there is a sense that we feel the old switcheroo has happened. Sometimes those kinds of experiences where things don't work out the way I originally had thought they would happen perhaps in our work life. Sometimes it happens with our relationships with friends and, and sometimes in our marriages and sometimes in our health. Or the loss of one dear to us, especially when it's sudden. This pandemic has been a time that sort of helped all of us know what it means that things don't always pan out exactly the way we thought they were going to. And we recognize that happening. It happens in our career. It happens in our plans for our lives. It is an all too common experience. And I think that there is something in Jacob's experience that may allow us to see something about what we have to do in order to make our way through that. One of the things that's so interesting about Jacob is that he recognizes that he's been had, but he doesn't stop. He remembers, and, and you may or may not agree that having two different wives, I mean, I, I, that's a whole different day's discussion, you know, whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, but one of the things, I don't think it's a good idea. Let me make that clear. Okay, is everybody clear? If you just zoomed in, Roy Smith does not believe having two wives at the same time would be a very good idea at all. I have one really good one. Jacob never, never loses sight of what it is that is the goal and the prize of his life. He gets on a major detour, and we do too sometimes, but he recognizes and doesn't get lost on the detour, but he, uh, but he keeps on going toward the destination that he seeks. I was thinking about getting lost on a detour. I think that happened to us once. That's really a bad feeling to get lost on a detour. Jacob realizes, I think, something important. And I think part of what Jacob realizes is that our lives are a curious interaction of the external circumstances of our lives that we often don't have control over at all. But also in the midst of that is our own sort of inner resolve and purpose and plan. And all of that is lived within the larger understanding of God's presence and plan in our life and for our world. Within the sort of principles and truths of God, we live out our lives in the midst of the, our own internal desires and resolve and, and plan, the experiences that we cannot share, and the constancy of God in the midst of it all. You know, I, I think that, and I titled this uh, sermon, What Goes Around Comes Around. And, and there's a certain sense that from the very beginning, you kind of get the sense that Jacob's going to have one of those moments. I mean, the guy's wheeling and dealing his whole life and taking advantage of people. And yet you have this sense that somehow before it's all said and done, someone's going to get him and what goes around is going to come around. And I think we sometimes begin to think about that in a kind of destiny or a kind of fate. And in fact, we often uh, talk about it as uh, like karma. You, you read, there was this crazy TV show about five or ten years ago called My Name is Earl. Did anybody, I'll, I'll admit I've watched it. Okay, so if you ever, anyway, but Earl, think, Earl had done all this terrible stuff in his life, and, and then things would work out. Either the person that had hurt him would get in a mess, or 
or he'd, he'd sort of make it through. Karma is actually a, a deep belief and understanding in the Hindu religion. You sort of have to believe in reincarnation, which we don't. I mean, we believe in resurrection as opposed to reincarnation. But in that religion, you're, you're, you, you have existences and then you have future ones, right? And so karma is what the kind of sum total of everything that determines what your next one's going to be like. But we often use it as a kind of, you're going to get what's coming to you. That's how we sort of use it in common language very often in our culture. And one of the things that I think we have to realize is that that's not just what's happening here. The story helps us to see that there is something much more important than thinking that somehow our lives are fated, are destined, or there's some sort of karma that's going to catch up with us and get us because of what we did or didn't do. But I think we would discover as we read this story, in fact, as we read not only this episode, but as we read the sort of entire journey, particularly of Jacob and his life, is that the one person or the one character that is constant in this story is God. God's love, God's purpose, God's plan remains constant. Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation, and there will be a land, there will be people as numerous as the sands of the sea, the stars in the sky, and there will be a blessing for the world through you. It is through you that the world will come to know who I am and what I'm about and how I work. And it's not some sort of fate or hopelessness, but it is a purpose. And so it is that Jacob, in spite of sometimes sort of doing things that are less than probably what God would have intended or wanted, continues to move this purpose forward. And so it is we see that underneath it, we discover who the God is who is leading this along. And Jacob is sometimes moving towards him and sometimes away from him. But in all of it, God remains. And what remains in the midst of that is the God who forgives us, the God who restores us, and the God who is always there for us, the God who is bound to us and to whom we are bound in love. As the story of Scripture continues to unfold for us, we'll continue to see that God at work. Sometimes his people are moving towards him. Sometimes his people are moving away. And then finally we come to that place where we begin to see, most clearly of all, the God who has come to live among us, to show us his love in action, in the flesh. And we discover that all along, we have known this God who loves us, forgives us, and never lets us go. May that be your strength. May that be your hope. May that be your care this day, and always. Amen. I want to invite you to listen to this beautiful hymn played by our, our bell ensemble, and let it be a moment for you to, to reflect on what it means to love and to serve that God who never lets us go, that we take our life and let it be consecrated to God.
Lovely. Thank you very much. I love that. I love that. I invite you to pray with me. Holy God, we give you thanks for this time that we have spent this day in worship. We give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for music that lifts our souls to you. We give you thanks for this time to pause. And Lord, we give you thanks as we go forth for all the ways that we, as your people, are finding in this unusual time to reach out in serving and caring others. Lord, may, may your love that's bound to us forever extend through us to touch your world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to share with me this confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. closing hymn this morning uh, is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, reminding us of the tie that we have with God and the ties that we have with his world. Let's sing together.
we go forth, go forth this day into the strength of God's love. May the peace of God and the power of God sustain you today and always. Amen. Also a bell ringer. This is Dave Carey. He's also a bell ringer. Are you getting a shot? Well, I'm trying to see Dave there. Okay. But Dave was a bell ringer today and also the sound man up here. And Matthew's the streaming man. And I'm the slide guy over here on the Rover Center. I hope y'all enjoyed my little tour of behind the scenes. If you hadn't, it's on Facebook that you're watching on right now. A little behind the scenes of what goes on up here. And we always want to encourage people to contact us if they want to help us. 
because they don't have, have to climb the ladder up the crow's nest. You can work at home in your pajamas at three in the morning, putting the slides in remotely using this great software called TeamViewer. So volunteer and help us out. We let Mary Gay, I hope you're having a good mm -hmm. vacation out there at the West, wherever you're at. And we can't wait to have you back. And Mark, we can't wait to have you back. And anyway, that's all y'all talk. Yep. yep. That's good. Thank you all for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, please reach out to the church office if you're enjoying the dial-in service, if you're still listening. And if you have friends or family members or congregants that would like to have a way to worship without the internet, they can call the church office during the week and get put on the phone tree. Every Sunday, we do a telephone stream where you can just dial an 800 number and put in the access code and listen in without needing any internet or anything. You can only listen live during the service. You can't go mm -hmm. back and listen to it. Correct. Just Sunday from 11 till now. Yeah. All right. We all have a great week. Be blessed and stay safe.